Hello everyone. Uh, let's discuss data ingestion on Google Cloud Platform. So the agenda for today's session is as follows. Uh, we'll first discuss about the data lifecycle. Uh, then we'll discuss some uh, thinking about data pipeline architectures. We'll discuss about how to migrate data from uh, on-premise or different cloud platforms to AWS using a storage transfer service. Uh, we'll discuss uh, the storage options like uh, GCS, BigQuery, uh, in the uh, GCP. Uh, then we'll be discussing about the streaming uh, service like PubSub. Uh, then we'll discuss about data flow and data fusion, uh, which can be used for data ingestion as well as data transformation. So uh, let's discuss about the uh, data lifecycle. So a typical data lifecycle, uh, be it any of the cloud, GCP, AWS, or Azure, or even on-premise, it follows a certain set of uh, pattern, right? Uh, the first thing will be the ingestion, uh, where we are going to collect the data from different sources and uh, put it somewhere in the uh, data lake. So let's say if you're using a on-premise, you will be using SDFS. Uh, and if you're using a Google Cloud, you are going to use uh, Google Cloud Storage, uh, then uh, you can use BigQuery, and uh, there are other storage options as well, like Cloud Storage, uh, Cloud Spanner, all those things. Uh, but before storing, we want to collect the data. Collecting the data may be done via different ways, uh, like you can have a App Engine. App Engine is a service in GCP which can be uh, you know configured, uh, which will be uh, pulling the data from different uh, say APIs, uh, then it would it might be populating in BigQuery or uh, uh, cloud storage, which uh, which we decide to be as our you know uh, base storage. Then for streaming, if you want to collect the data, cloud PubSub is a is a way where you can put the data. It is similar to not similar to but uh, an alternative I would say uh, to Kafka in on premise. So I am not saying similar because. Uh, the way the cloud officer work is quite different than how uh, uh, Apache Kafka works. If uh, we have the historical data in place, you can use uh, transfer appliances. Uh, these appliances will uh, go to your data center, copy the data and bring it back to the cloud data center location. Uh, there's a cloud transfer service, cloud transfer service uh, that we are going to uh, see in some time. It is basically uh, you can configure uh, your source and uh, the data will be flowing over the internet. BigQuery also provide a BigQuery transfer service. And you can also have a cloud function. A cloud function is a service where you can have your small snippets and you can uh, you know configure it uh, to maybe uh, pull the data from some API and store it somewhere. So cloud function has multiple use cases, uh, which we'll be discussing when we'll be discussing GCP in detail. Uh, but as an overview, these are different mechanisms through which you can, you know, read the data from different source and uh, dump it somewhere. So where do you want to store the data? Uh, you are you can use cloud storage. Uh, cloud storage can have audio, video, text, all kind of uh, files, text file, XML, JSON, Parquet. It is basically uh, uh, storage, object, object based storage, which we'll be discussing in some time. Cloud Big Table. Cloud Big Table is basically a NoSQL database. Uh, it's uh, like HBase in on-premise. Uh, then you can uh, have a Cloud SQL if you want to have a relational data store. You can have a Cloud SQL or a Cloud Spanner. Uh, it will be uh, providing you the relational database like a MySQL capability. Then if you want to have in-memory store, you can have a Cloud Memory Store. And uh, for the data warehouse, we will have uh, BigQuery. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, the first thing is you want to collect the data. So there are some service that is required to collect the data. I have discussed about it. Once the data is collected, you want to store it somewhere. So storage, uh, most popularly used are uh, cloud storage and big queries, which we'll be discussing uh, uh, in some time. Then once the data is available in the, those storage, now you want to analyze and process the data. So you, you might want to clean the data. You might want to join different data sets and uh, create an output uh, which will be used by the uh, machine learning engineers or data analysts uh, for visualization purpose. Uh, 
So there are different services available for that as well. Uh, the first one is BigQuery. So BigQuery is a data warehouse. So you can, uh, you know, read the data from BigQuery, write to BigQuery. You can uh, apply the SQL queries on different tables and create a, an output. And this can be scheduled with the help of a, a scheduler that is a Cloud Composer, which is in uh, GCP. Cloud Composer is basically the managed version of Airflow. Airflow is a scheduler. Uh, we will be discussing when we we will be having sessions about Airflow. So you uh, Cloud Data Flow is the another service. Cloud Data Flow we will be discussing in some time, which is a managed service uh, which uses Apache Beam as as its backend. Cloud data flow is basically again used for you know reading the data from a batch data source or the streaming data source. So batch may be something like a GCS or a BigQuery, and the streaming may be something like a Kafka or a PubSub. Uh, then we have a cloud data proc. Cloud data proc is the managed uh, Hadoop distributed system. Um, cloud data proc is mostly used for Spark specific use case where you have your custom uh, Spark code. And you want to, uh, you know, run it on GCP. So data proc is the service to go, go ahead with. Cloud data prep is another service which is used for the uh, same purpose. It provides some functionalities. Uh, then we have the cloud data fusion. So uh, some people who don't want to write code and they want to use, you know, some uh, fancy UI uh, where you can drag and drop uh, different uh, components like a ETL tool. This is the uh, tool to go ahead with. Cloud data fusion. Uh, at the back end, it uses Apache Spark. Then once we have the data, uh, once we have ingested the data, uh, we have it in some storage. After uh, after applying processing, uh, applying some uh, uh, logics uh, for the transformation, uh, you will be having a final uh, layer, uh, which we call as a reporting layer or a visualization layer. There you are going to have the data that the tools like uh, Tableau or uh, Power BI uses. So for that purpose, uh, GCP has its own um, own offering. Uh, so Google Cloud Data Studio is something that you can use for this purpose. And then you have a Google Sheet. Uh, so say if you have a very small uh, set of data, you can use Google Sheet for you know some quick transformations. So this is the data lifecycle. Also, uh, once this is done, uh, we can have a machine learning data science use cases. It may be in the analyze and process, and you can use same set of tools and then uh, other tools like a Vertex AI that is available, uh, which uh, you can use to build your AI models. Now, uh, if you are given a task to create a data pipeline architecture, uh, you have to think about See uh, all these scenarios, like uh, if I am going to create a data pipeline, uh, what are the different things that we want to do? So the first step is ingestion, where you are going to uh, you know read the data from different sources and uh, bring it in the GC, GCP, or I would say uh, like in the GCP environment uh, for your project, uh, for your particular project. So data ingestion can be done using cloud PubSub, cloud data flow, data fusion. Uh, you can also have data proc in ingestion as well, uh, or data uh, other like uh, storage transfer service can be available over here, so that you can uh, you know uh, tra transfer the data from one premise to GCP. Then uh, for processing, you can have data proc, BigQuery. Uh, you can also have data flow, uh, like uh, the data flow is being used for multiple uh, use cases. So you can have the processing layer as data uh, data flow in the processing layer. BigQuery, as I mentioned, and DataProc, which is a managed uh, offering of Hadoop. Then once you have processed the data, you have to serve it. So you have you can be having Local Studio or Data Studio, uh, which is a visualization layer. Uh, now this is similar to Tableau or Power BI. So it is a serving layer. Now these three are uh, the main uh, components, core components for the data pipeline. Uh, storage is up to you. Uh, if you want to store the data in the data, uh, you want a data lake type of capability, then you can have it in the cloud storage, GCS. It is similar to like uh, you're storing the data in SDFS in on-premise. Then uh, if your data is relational in nature, you can use cloud SQL. If it is a uh, no SQL kind of a 
data, then you can use cloud Bigtable. Uh, then you can use BigQuery for your data warehouse. Once this the setup is done, you might want to schedule your job because uh, these jobs are going to run every day, uh, if not every hour or every week. It it will be running in a proper schedule. So there is a Airflow, uh, which is a which is a, a scheduler and uh, GCP provides Cloud Composer and the backend it uses Airflow. Uh, you can use Airflow to uh, you know schedule all your jobs. So say I want to run the ingestion first when it is completed. I want to process the data once it is completed. I want to populate this dashboard in uh, Looker. So all these things, uh, the uh, you know task based dependency and time based dependency, all those things can be uh, done using Cloud Composer. Then uh, there is something called the metadata management. Metadata management, basically all the metadata of your organization, uh, be it uh, in the database, uh, like a uh, MySQL, uh, all the Cloud SQL, let's take an example of GCP, uh, Cloud SQL or BigQuery, all the metadata can be uh, seen in the data catalog. So these are the different set of tools uh, that you might be thinking of you, uh, based on your use, use case, uh, this can add or, uh, you know, you can delete or add some, some tools here, but a basic general architecture looks like this. So let's discuss about data ingestion now. Uh, first thing is migration. If you want to migrate your data from AWS to GCP or from on-premise to GCP or bit in, within the same uh, cloud, but on a different bucket. So let's say I have a bucket named test. I want to move it to the bucket named demo. So I can have a, I can use this storage transfer service and this will be a, uh, doing all the, uh, it will be providing all the, you know, uh, options or a basic minimum required uh, details uh, to configure your uh, storage transfer service. Once that is done, it can run on the schedule. Like if there's a new file coming in, it will uh, do the incremental load. So you don't have to write any line of code. Uh, it uh, has a centralized job management port, uh, portal, I would say, where you can see the status, say whether it is completed or not. Uh, it's secured and it's reliable uh, at every step. So it makes sure that no none of your data is getting lost or compromised. You can configure data transfer to uh, you know meet all the business need like uh, whenever you want to transfer and how much you want to transfer and when you want to transfer. All those things can be uh, done by using the storage transfer service. So it is built for that purpose only. Now let's discuss about Google Cloud Storage. Uh, storage, uh, like I mentioned, uh, if you want to have an alternative of SDFS, uh, though both are different, though both uh, both are you know different technically, but main purpose is the same. Like it is an object-based storage, uh, not a file-based storage. So here, every file you are uh, keeping it is stored as an object, and those objects are immutable. You you can't uh, you know edit it. You have to either re-upload override or you have to delete and then uh, if you don't want you can delete it but you cannot update it so it's an immutable uh, it, these objects are stored in a something called as a bucket so you can uh, think of bucket as a folder in your uh, d drive just say uh, just an example uh, bucket name is globally unique uh, so let's say someone in one company uh, have created a gcp bucket uh, with uh, say name uh, say test one two three uh, now uh, you cannot create the bucket if it is already existing. Though though uh, it is not in your organization, but globally, if it is, if the bucket name is used, you cannot use it. It can be public private based on use case. So there may be a use case where you want to keep your bucket public, which uh, which is very you know, uh, you would be providing only the read access. So if you say you want to host a static website, then in that case you want to keep it public because uh, if you want to uh, you know open it up, open it up for the uh, external users to use otherwise you can keep it private uh but in the buckets uh, there are some rules that you have to follow uh, like bucket name can only contain lowercase letter numeric characters uh, dashes and dots spaces are not allowed bucket names uh, generally then people use only a small case character and dashes uh, and numbers uh, underscore uh, uh, for some, it is uh, not a. It, it it doesn't mean that you can't use underscore. It's just that the common practice I have seen uh, throughout my career that bucket names are uh, 
separate means bucket names are separated using a dash instead of an underscore. Bucket names should start and end with a number or letter. Uh, it should contain three to uh, sixty-three characters. Then uh, it cannot be uh, containing Google, uh, you know, in the uh, in the name, or it cannot have the prefix with a G double O G. Uh, it it can be public private like I have told. Uh, once you delete a bucket, anyone can reuse it with the name uh, for a new bucket. So let's say I have a bucket named customers. Uh, now if I delete this customer bucket, then it will be again available to the uh, outside world as well as in your organization. So globally, anyone can create another bucket called customer. Uh, in that case, if you want to reuse, you want to recreate the name, uh, with, you want to recreate the bucket with the same name, you won't be able to do it because uh, in the meanwhile, someone else have uh, recreated it. So we have to uh, make sure that we are keeping our bucket unique and uh, name or uh, you can have a company name or uh, somewhere in between or some name which is generally, uh, you know, uh, not used by other people. So no one would be using a company name. Uh, like if, if say I have, I'm working on a Google, so I will be having some prefix, uh, maybe GG, uh, any any sort of an abbreviation. Uh, then we are almost sure that no one be would be using uh, the same uh, same name in the bucket. Now uh, uh, let's talk about BigQuery. Uh, so uh, in the on premise we have Hive. Hive is used for uh, as a data warehouse for Hadoop. And if you're using a cloud data distribution, there is a Impala. Impala is also a data warehouse, which is very fast. Uh, now, if you want to move to BigQuery, uh, if you want to move to GCP, BigQuery is the option. So it's a fully managed solution with the petabyte scale, and uh, it is very cost effective uh, warehouse. So you can uh, you know uh, run uh, uh, the new query on huge amount of data sets, and uh, it will be very performant. Uh, best thing about Big, BigQuery is it's you. Uh, it's a serverless architecture. Uh, you don't have to manage anything. Uh, you just have to create your uh, data sets. Of course, you have to manage the permissions, like what all permission you want to uh, give to BigQuery. But from the infrastructure perspective, you don't have to install anything. It's uh, fully managed by Google. Uh, it is uh, scalable. Uh, you can have a you can query terabytes of data, you can query petabytes of data, and it is possible with BigQuery. Of course, the uh, time taken to query TB and petabyte of data would be uh, different uh, diff different based on your query, like how complex your query is. Then uh, you can also, uh, best thing is that you storage is different and uh, compute is different. So uh, like an on-premise where you have the fixed storage and compute, uh, in BigQuery, uh, you can have a storage layer uh, as a different in a different location. Uh, location, when I would say, in a different uh, different server, and your compute will be always different. So let's say if I if someone wants to query a table, the data will be uh, resting somewhere else, and uh, if I want to query, I'll uh, use the compute resources, and those compute resources will be uh, lying somewhere else. So this helps to auto scale. Like if I want to uh, uh, query my uh, you know, query a table or set of tables, and the query is pretty complex. Uh, like uh, it it is going to deal with terabytes of data. So you don't you don't might not want to uh, you know have a smaller compute instance. You would be uh, looking for a bigger compute instance. So since it, both are separate, like a storage is somewhere else. Compute can be uh, scaled uh, horizontally as well as vert vertically. So let's say if I want to query 100 GB of data, I want to have uh, more than that uh, as a compute so that I am able to query it. Otherwise, we will be getting the out of memory kind of an issue. So that is possible since uh, compute and storage are separate. Uh, this model is now used by most most of the cloud-based data warehouse. So for example, Snowflake. Snowflake also often, uh, have the compute separate from storage so you can uh, auto scale like upscale downscale and you can save cost on uh, compute then pricing model there are two type of pricing model one is the on demand so when you write a query the amount of data in bytes uh, like how if you uh, say 1000 bytes of data is going to be processed then you will be charged for only 1000 1000 uh, bytes of uh, processing 
and also first terabyte every month is free then you have the capacity based pricing uh, number of slots also there is a concept of slots uh, in bigquery uh, if you are going to uh, use capacity based uh, pricing this uh, actually gives a lot of discount because you are saying at the start of the year that throughout the year i am going to use this much of resource based on because you know your data set how much uh, and you know your processes how much data you want to consume then uh, it will be charged for compute capacity used to run queries and there there is a concept of slots uh, which we will be discussing if we discuss the query in uh, detail in a later later sessions so there is a concept of a slot uh, and the number of slots you are going to consume over time you will be you will be charging for that so it's called as a capacity based pricing bigquery gives you different ways to uh, you know interact you can use a console interface uh, which is a command uh, which is a which will provide you a ui uh, which is very much you know uh, <clears throat> very user friendly as it provides you the editor where you can like scroll and run it and see the results uh, but if you someone wants to use a command line tool uh, they can also use a gcp a bigquery command line tool where you can write the query and you will be getting the result on the command line now other than that uh, let's say if i want to use it programmatically so i can use python java javascript go uh, which will uh, which provides those libraries to interact with uh, bigquery and also there is a rest api a rest api or also rpc api uh, you just call those apis and it will return you the result so there are different ways to uh, interact with bigquery and let's say if i want to uh, have a dashboard which runs over bigquery you can use odbc or jdbc driver for the same uh, sql syntax is basically nc standard uh, so simple uh, the standard sql that we generally do uh, like in mysql same syntax would be working over uh, bigquery as well so it supports all the thing that is provided by nc sql like joins nested fields all the aggregations like a group by a window analytic functions uh, multiple statement queries and uh, it also have a uh, special functions as well so called the geo special analytics which is generally used in telecom world uh, it has a lot of uh, functions to use that uh, you know to you to do the geo special analytics let's discuss about streaming ingestion uh, so pubsub is the service which is fully managed uh, real time messaging service it allows you to send and receive the data from uh, uh, different applications so uh, if i want to uh, if i want to move everything to gcp and uh, say i have a, a interface i have a ui uh, let's say if, uh, let's uh, as a, a hypothetical example let's say that you are a startup and you have you are having a ios as well as android app and you you are getting a lot of data like uh, KYC data or the transaction data, and you want to deal it real time. So what you will be doing, you will be reading those data and pushing it to PubSub, and PubSub will be uh, PubSub uh, provides you the seven days retention or fourteen days retention period. So for fourteen days, that data will be available on PubSub. And if you want to have a real time use case, you can uh, there can be another service like a data proc or a sorry a data fusion or a data flow, or you can have your custom cloud functions. which would be reading from those pubsub uh, uh, pubsub topics and you would be you know processing your data so best thing about it is uh, that it is durable message storage like you want to keep it for 14 days or 7 days retention you would be uh, sure that uh, this data won't be lost then there is a real time message delivery so like since it is a real time or streaming use case so as soon as the message is received with uh, minimal latency uh, you would be able to you know process that data high availability this means that if uh, one uh, one data center goes down uh, or in, in the one data center one rack goes down then uh, since it is highly available there would be other instance which will uh, keep on reading the uh, data from uh, this uh, big query uh, sorry from the pubsub a uh, consistent performance scale so even you are getting 20000 messages per second or a uh, 100000 messages per second uh, pubsub uh, will make sure that you know performance is not impacted how it looks like so there will always be a publisher publisher may be uh, uh, 
it may be a service that is running uh, over uh, you know uh, let's say i have a app android app it it can be a publisher whatever uh, information it receives from the user it can publish the data into the pubsub so pubsub has a concept of topic similar to kafka and each topic will have a storage if you see this is a storage so once the message is published by the publisher in the topic it will be stored in the message storage now once this is uh, available anyone can subscribe so there can be multiple subscribers uh, i can be a subscriber uh, there can be 10 other people who are subscribed to the same topic and they will have they can read the data at their pace so it may be possible that i have read 100 message another subscriber has uh, read 80 messages so pubsub make sure that uh, it maintains the state of uh, e subscription now who all these sub uh, so if you create, you have to create a subscription for a topic and there can be multiple subscriber for the subscription. So <laughs> let's take an example. All the data you have, uh, you know, published is going to be used by the analytics team in real time. So th those, uh, and they, they have decided to use data flow. So data flow can be a subscriber, uh, where, you know, it, it is going to read from a subscription and it will, uh, it will be you know processing analyzing those uh, those messages once that is done it will send the acknowledgement that okay i have uh, processed this message you can remove it from your subscription a good thing about pubsub is it it is pretty well integrated with the uh, gcp services so you know you can read the data from uh, cloud logs apis like i mentioned all the android applications or ios application they, they can be uh, you know reading the data from provided by the users and it will be uh, uh, transferring it to the pubsub or publishing to the pub, uh, pubsub topics there is a data flow data flow can also be used to produce the data or publish the data in the pubsub uh, maybe if there is some intermediate layer that you want to keep in and you want to store those data in real time in pubsub you can use data flow cloud storage can also be used to generate messages to pubsub and then there's a compute engine uh, which can be used to publish the message similar to that we have multiple subscribers as well cloud monitoring data flow compute engine networking and there are other subscribers as well so in the cloud function also you can write some message to read the data from pubsub so all those possibilities are there so cloud pubsub is pretty much integrated with the uh, google cloud services now we have, we have been talking about data flow. So data flow is a fully managed, uh, distributed batch and streaming services, which, uh, which makes sure that minimum uh, latency and processing time and cost uh, is offered. So there's an auto scaling capability as well. So uh, good, good thing about it is uh, once you create a data flow job, all the provisioning and management are done by GCP. You don't have to worry about it. You just have to worry about the code that you are writing. Also, uh, it has the capability of horizontal auto scaling. So based on if the load increases on your data flow, uh, say streaming job, it can scale, uh, it can scale up. And when, uh, you know, there's a uh, load is, uh, you know, pretty much uh, taken care of, we can downscale. So it will manage your cost effectively. Uh, the code will look similar for batch and streaming, which is again a good thing. Uh, then uh, it uses Apache Beam at the backend. So Apache Beam basically was built to provide you a uniform model. So there were different tools like Apache Spark, there was then uh, Apache Flink and others as well. So what Beam Beam has developed that you you can use Spark in the at the backend as an engine. You can write your code in the Beam, and all the code will be uh, translated to the Spark code, and it will be executed on the Spark engine. And similarly, if you want to use a Flink runner, so there is a concept of a runner. You can uh, <clears throat> you can use Beam and say that I want to run it on Flink, so it will take care of running it on Flink. So same code can be written, uh, same code can be run in a Spark as well as Flink. And can be and the same code can be run in the data flow. So it also provides a data flow runner. Google that Google has developed GCP as well, and same data flow runner can be used to uh, run your Beam jobs. It also creates a DAG like uh, thing uh, like autograph 
uh, it will uh, create a autograph and uh, it will see that what is the best execution path uh, which will minimize uh, minimize the uh, you know compute resources uh, like uh, with the minimum resources if if possible it can uh, run your job so uh, also from the resources perspective as well as time perspective so it will see that which execution path can be used so that it can uh, you know uh, run the uh, job in minimum time this is how it looks like uh, if you want to run a data flow job for the streaming pipeline you can have data flow here so there is a bounded raw data in uh, cloud sql so let's say i have data available in sql i have data available in um, cloud storage i i can use this data flow batch in a streaming pipeline this batch in streaming pipeline will process all the data is available in uh, bigquery or cloud sql or cloud storage or popsub for that matters and this data will be once that uh, processing is done we can uh, put push it back to bigquery we can push it back to uh, cloud popsub or we can uh, you know based on the use case like if i want to have a stream to stream uh, input output you can use popsub as a source as well as destination and if you want to have a uh, stream to batch like you want to read from popsub and you want to write to bigquery or gcs that capability is also available in the uh, data flow then uh, let's move to the last uh, service that we are going to discuss today for data ingestion which is a data fusion so there may, might be case that some users uh, some developers are not very much uh, comfortable with uh, writing uh, you know spark code so data fusion provides you a managed spark hadoop service uh, it uses uh, it, it provides you a you know fancy ui where you can drag and drop uh, different uh, connectors uh, let's say if you want to read from a source called as a bigquery so there would be a connector for bigquery it will be reading from bigquery and then you can have uh, different connectors for joining the data and then for uh, uh, aggregating the data all those connectors are available in data fusion and it will be a drag and drop ui where pretty much like uh, other etl tools uh, it provides integration with on premise as well as other public cloud storage so it can be used as a data ingestion tool since it has the capability to connect to on premise it has the capability to connect to the public clouds like uh, other clouds like aws and gcp good thing about it is the connectors and transformations are pre configured and it has the connectors for majority of the sources that we are going to use like rdbms streaming source like a popsub hadoop then uh, other public clouds like i mentioned azure and uh, aws storage sources graphical interface like i have mentioned uh, it provides you a graphical way of creating your spark job and uh, running it and uh, it has native integration with other gcp services like cloud storage and the infra this is how it looks like so if you see there are multiple sources available uh, like reading from adls bigquery bigtable ftp file excel you can read from all those sources you can apply different data uh, quality rules or data standardization rules like if you want to pass your csv uh, you want to do uh, remove the null field or you want to use the union anything you can uh, use and you can also use different transformations like uh, group by distinct deduplicate joiners all those transformations are available once uh, you have read the data you applied the transformation data fusion will uh, uh, data fusion will re will uh, provide you the capability to do so and once the job is completed you can store it in your uh, store uh, like preferred storage like uh, cloud storage cloud sql uh, bigquery the table whichever you want to use it looks something like this uh, there is a let's say i want to use the uh, gcs file uh, like gcs google cloud storage as a source so i can have a connector for gcs i'll uh, configure it saying that i want to use from uh, read the data from this bucket and uh, i have the data wrangler which will be uh, you know used for uh, uh, different uh, data wrangling operations uh, then you can also read from multiple sources in the same job so you you are reading one uh, one type of data from gcs another type of data from bigquery 
then you want to join, join those data sets. Uh, once the data is joined, you want to write, write to BigQuery again. So mm -hmm. you just have to drag and drop all the uh, different components. Once uh, that is done, uh, you can run your job. On, if there is a button over here, you can run your job using this and uh, you will be getting the output. You can also schedule it, uh, like you create the data fusion, uh, like flow, and you can schedule it to run every every day at 6 a.m., uh, for example. So the, these are the different services uh, that we we want to discuss for data ingestion today. Uh, we'll be discussing them in details and we'll be seeing the uh, proper uh, lab, lab session uh, where we'll be going through some of these services and see how it works. Thank you.